I love to travel, and when I travel, I find unique things that I can bring home where I can add my own personal touch, like this interesting vase. So in today's show, we're all about adding a personal touch to everything we do. I don't know about you, but spring is one of my favorite times of year. There's so many beautiful flowers to choose from, and tulips are one of my absolute favorites. Just thought I'd show you a creative and imaginative way to use some flowers for a tablescape. If you're having friends over for a spring dinner or an Easter luncheon, you can apply these ideas and put your own personal signature on them. What I'm gonna do here is give you two options. One is a little tulip in a tiny vase like this. All we have here is a single tulip stem with a bit of the leaf and just a little barren twig here to the side to tie the name tag to. Now, here's one that has a little more of a garden theme to it. You wanna take scotch tape and then I'm gonna apply the last piece of it. So with that in place, what I'm gonna do is take this little thin ribbon. I've tried doing this before without the tape and it's a nightmare, so make sure you tie it up. And then you just wanna put a little bow here and just give it a tug like that when you've got it all tied up, you can see that. Then just take a little bit of this floral foam carve off a little piece and just press it down into the container like that. So then all you do is just take a tulip blossom like this, snip it off, and push it in like that. I like just a little bit of greenery. And then I'm gonna take some Spanish moss and just finish off around the top of it just to cover the floral foam. And then I like to take just a little bit of rustic twine to tie on the name. Really festive and fits the season. Easily done and I think very creative. And it's a little party favor that your friends can take home. Just make sure they get this tulip in water though or it will wilt. Coming up next on Garden Style. Get in their world, get that charm and that expression. Tips for taking great pictures of your pets. Yep, that's it, raise your head just slightly. Beautiful, beautiful. Just to the right, work it, work it, smile. All right, Moose, that's it, I'm spent. Good job, you're a natural, buddy. Hey, if you're looking for ways to get some great pics of your furry or feathered friends, you're gonna love this piece. I'm Mark Fonville, and I'm a photographer. I've been shooting pet photos for a long time, and I know it's really challenging to get good pet photos. But uh, with a little bit of uh, luck and uh, some good planning, you can come out with some better photos. This is my little friend, Cookie. She's my pet, and she's been working with me for about 12 years, so she's a, she's a pro. So I've got uh, several hundred photos of Cookie, yes. Get down and get closer to the animal. Get in their world and try to get that uh, charm and that expression from their eyes. Don't try to get the whole documentary from the tip of the nose to the tip of the tail, but just get in their face and uh, get in their world a little bit. Sometimes it's maybe even helpful to bring them up, bring them up to your level, like uh, on a sofa, a wall that you can put them up on, and so that they're really uh, in your face. Lighting is very important, and we could talk a lot about that, but essentially what I look for is a good constant even light so that uh, you're not getting that real harsh light or real harsh shadows from a direct sunlight. I try to find a shady spot where there is ample light a lot of abundant light, but uh, it's more reflected, maybe from the back, that's always good. Now, if you have a dark pet, especially, or a black colored pet, uh, you might wanna use a flash, but uh, don't overuse it. It can really fatigue your animal and they will just get real worn out with that flash. So you gotta give them a break, take a break yourself. One of the things that um, I see in 
photographs is people trying to get too much or get everything in one shot. And what I would say is think about your composition. If you really get down to it, what is this one single thing, the heroic thing that you want to feature in your photograph so that that brings drama to your photo? Just to have fun shooting with your pet, it takes a lot of patience. Uh, quality time comes from, from quantity time and quality photos come from taking a lot of photos. Uh, so spend some time and get in their world and really just see what they like to do. Just have some fun. When it comes to making gifts for friends and family, I like to do something a little different. I'll show you what I mean when we come back. You know, everyone loves a homemade gift, especially ladies. And when you can create the beauty product or something that allows them to relax, they love it even that much more. So this is a sugar honey scrub, which is great for your face and for your hands, and it's so easy to make. And then I wanna show you how to make some wonderful bath salts. So let's start with the sugar honey scrub. You're gonna take a half a cup of sugar. This makes about a half a pint, so just keep that in mind. I'm gonna take half a tablespoon of glycerin, and I'm pouring it in here. And then I'm going to take some honey, and this is one teaspoon of honey. Now I'm gonna chop all this together and combine the glycerin and the sugar thoroughly. So you can see I have this pretty well uh, completely blended. It has a nice texture to it. See, it's still dry. And now it's just a matter of applying an essential oil. You could use lavender. In this case, I'm using some citrus. I'm going to apply about six drops. There we go. And then to this, if you wanna color it, you can use just a little bit of food coloring. It would be the only artificial ingredient that you would be applying here. So this one was purple. Created that by just using some blue and red. And it just takes a few drops. Here, I'd only use a couple. It just gives it a pretty color. Look at that completely transforms it. And then it's just a matter of packing this in a jar. I would double the recipe so you can make a full pint of it. And there you go, it makes a beautiful gift. All right, now let's talk about um, some bath salts because they're equally easy to make. You're gonna use Epsom salts. What I've got here is a cup and a quarter. I'm just gonna pour it in the bowl. And that will be followed by a fourth of a cup of baking soda. There we go. I just wanna mix this together thoroughly. Now what I'm gonna do is add the essential oil to give it some aroma. So about a dozen drops of the citrus oil here. Lavender is also very good to use. Or just combine some things, come up with your own recipe. And then it's a matter of adding a little food coloring. If we go with yellow again, if we wanna go with orange, and do about three drops of yellow and then just a little bit of red here to make it orange. Doesn't take much in the way of food coloring. And work this together like that and you can see the color coming through. Look at that gorgeous color. It's a nice sort of salmon orange. Put it in decorative jars and people just love to receive this. origami critters remind me of my pets, Harley and Izzy. I've always loved them for that reason. They were designed by interior designer Charles Gandy, and I've made them look really special in my space by creating this plexiglass box. If you have personal collectibles and favorite design items in your house, drag them out of the closet, get them out of the cupboard, and create a special little moment. It personalizes them for your design aesthetic. So get creative with your personal mementos. It'll help you design outside your comfort zone. We'll be right back with a personal touch from long, long ago when Garden Style returns. So if we roll the clock back to say 1770, 
If you're buying clothes, you're likely to have those clothes handmade. That's everything. Well, of course, today we don't do that, but think about this. Isn't it nice to have a few things that are handmade that express, well, your personal style? Hey, Drew, what are you making, a pattern? Yes, sir, I'm just working on a waistcoat for a gentleman. Oh. So it's a bespoke piece, and in the 18th century, most people are coming in they tell me what they want, right. and then I make it happen. So there is the speaking, the bespoke. Absolutely, right. absolutely. So this gentleman wanted a red and white striped jacket. Um, you can see it's got cuffs on it. The buttonholes are false, and it relies on hooks and eyes to actually close across the chest. So this is gonna be a nice, lightweight summer jacket for this And this, this is actually a request that was made in the 1770s here in Salem. Absolutely. Very stylish. So. And then this jacket, more of a working class, and so it's got wool, it's nice and durable, it's gonna to be tough, gonna to be warm. Functional buttonholes on it. Uh, the back is just plain linen, and so I didn't bother using expensive wool sure. uh, for the right. back. Of it. I see. Now Drew, this is what's so fascinating to me. Mm -hmm. I mean, this is all hand-stitched, the whole thing. Absolutely. We're 60 years away from a sewing machine. 60 years away. So if you go to a tailor shop and you get even just a waistcoat or vest made, you can wear that with a suit, you can wear it by itself, and it's really gonna pop and make the garment stand sure. out and give it a unique look. Buttons, pockets placed in different places. If you're fond of wearing a watch chain, then it gives you that availability as well. And to finish off the wardrobe, you've gotta have shoes. Mm, absolutely. So here at the Single Brothers House, I'm gonna step across the hall and take a look at some. You're welcome. Thank, Thank you, you so in. much, yeah. So Sunrisa, back in the day, there were no like just order shoe sizes. Every shoe was measured to a foot, just like you're doing here. Correct. You are getting custom fit shoes, and so the price of your shoe is not going to be dependent necessarily on my work, even though I'm doing this all by hand. It's gonna be dependent on the style and the quality of materials you want. I see. In fact, I have some examples here, if you would let's, like to yeah, see them. Yeah, let's take a look at them. If you're finished with my measurements. Yes. <laughs> Very good. So here we have some different qualities and styles. Mm. We have our most basic style here. That look, does look pretty basic. <laughs> yes, yeah, so these are referred to as schlops. They're a backless shoe, as you can see. Well, those look like they'd be popular today. Yes, you see a lot of clogs today. These are work shoes, so gardening shoes, yeah. potters, people who are working barefoot. You just kick them off. Kick them off. Perfect. No matter how dirty your hands are, you can slip them back on. Yeah. This would be your business shoe. So still, the rough side of the leather is on the outside. Mm -hmm. Smooth sides against your foot, more comfortable. Mm -hmm. Dyed, you do have buckles. I see. Boy, this one feels nice and soft. Yes, this is cordovan leather. This uh -huh. would be your most expensive leather. Right. Typically, this is coming out of Cordova, Spain. Mm. Usually either a goat or sheep. There's some discrepancy about what they were using. I see. The leather's dyed before it's tanned, oh. making it a very high, fine quality. Yeah. And this shoe is quite expensive because you have the cordovan on the outside and then go tight on the inside. I see. So you have a double layer of leather. Very much a gentleman of means shoe. Yes. Very good. And look at the boots over here. Is this yes. something like a soldier would wear? This is something you wear if you are riding horses a lot. I see. Unless you have a job where you need to protect your calves against the wear and tear of a stirrup leather, mm. you're not really going to want to spend the money for these because you have so much leather involved. I see. They're expensive. So what would a soldier around the Revolutionary War make, say, a month? About six dollars. Six dollars. Six dollars. Something like this you're looking at roughly a week's worth of your pay. My goodness, so they were very dear, good shoes. Yes, you take care of them, you'll get them resold, right. rehealed, yeah. take very good care of polishing, oiling. But this whole idea of having something specially made and to fit your personal style, it was certainly there. Yes, it was. You can get your leather in many different colors, many different qualities. You can personalize your buckle. You're expected to provide this, I don't. You're doing a great job carrying on this craft. Thank you. Coming up next, I'll show you how to turn an ordinary bottle into something not only personal, but useful. You know, I never want to throw anything away, and why should you? For instance, take these bottles. I save them. If you can use them in some way, well, it just keeps them from going to the landfill, and you can come up with some really clever ways to save money. I'm gonna take an ordinary bottle and just take some string 
You just determine how high you want your vase to be. I've just wrapped it around roughly where I want to cut the bottle off. And at that point, I'm just going to take the string and tie it in a knot. Take the scissors and cut the strings off there. The way this technique works is that this little band actually serves as a source of heat. It's fuel for a fire. I'm gonna amplify the heat by adding some fuel in the way of fingernail polish remover. And I've put some in this plastic cup here. And I'm just gonna take this off and remember sort of where my line is. And I'm gonna drop it in here and soak it. And with it soaked, I'm gonna bring it back and put it on top. And I wanna make sure that it's even straight across, is what's gonna happen is we're gonna heat up this band and through a contrast in temperature, we're gonna break the top off. I always like to put on some of these goggles and also some gloves. I'm gonna move my source of fuel over here. And I'm gonna be able to hold a glass bottle like this. And I have a bucket of water here, just room temperature. And what I'm gonna do is start my fire. It's going to heat up the bottle just at this very Place. So what I'm going to do is keep the string on here and eventually the fire will go out and as soon as the fire goes out, I'll plunge it into the water. Ta-da! And some of these are going to be a little more jagged than others. Hey, it's not actually perfect, but it's okay because we're going to sand it down from here, all right? You want to take a medium grit sandpaper. I like to fold this. So this is a hundred grit. You're gonna sand off those really sharp edges of the glass. So you let the corner kind of drop down because you want to get the inside of it too. You want to reduce any chance of cutting yourself. You can see I've really taken that down. It's really soft all the way around like this. And to just finish it off, what I'm gonna do is take a little finer sandpaper and I'm gonna do the same thing and go on the inside and the top. Take my glove off. You can see that's really smooth along the edge. These are really cool. It's a great way to save resources. Well, that's all the time we have for today's show. I hope you've enjoyed it as much as I have. We focused on personalizing things. You know, the way I look at it, if you can take something ordinary and create something extraordinary out of it, well, there's a lot of pleasure in that. I'd like for you to follow me on Facebook, and you can sign up for my newsletter by going to pallensmith.com. There we have recipes, ideas, and also ways that you can take, again, ordinary things and make something really special and personal out of them. Until next time, I hope you'll grow, cook, and design something personal for yourself. For Garden Style, I'm Alan Smith. Okay, ready and action. So today's show is all about that. Finding things and adding that personal touch to it. We put the pet to everything we do. All about adding a personal touch to everything we do. You're gonna love the show. I can tell. Right? You sure? <laughs>